It's June the 26th, 2019. This is Five Ways Show About Worcester. I am Mike Benedetti. This is Brendan Malikin. Today we're talking to school committee challenger Chantel Bathia. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. Mike, Welcome. You've done something a bit different yes. with your hair today. You know what I did, Brendan? <laughs> I woke up this morning and I was like, let me get the camera to show the truth of my hair. I woke up this morning and I was like, do I want to comb my hair? Do I want to shave my hair off? And I took a washcloth and did wash my face and then just Upward. kept going accidentally and then I was like perfect you went against the grain and it turned out okay perfect you know I mean that's how you do it that's how you do it <laughs> all right uh, Chateau why are you running for school committee and how have you been active in Worcester until now um, so the reason I'm running is because I got upset all right. <laughs> um, at a school committee meeting about the talk topic was sex ed. Uh, I got upset, and I said it was time for me to run. So I did because everybody knows Chantel does not like politics. She doesn't <laughs> like the game at all. People were like, "You know, you always said that you would never run." And I did, uh, but when you get fed up with something and you know that things need to change, you step up to do that. Okay. So that's what I did, and why I chose to pull papers and run. Mm -hmm. Then, um, what do I do in the city? some of everything. Okay. I'm on different boards such as RCAP Solutions. I am the president of the Worcester Women's History Project. I am the chair of the Worcester County Commission on the Status of Women. Mm -hmm. um, I work, I'm on the steering committee for the Investing in Girls Alliance. So I do a lot of things around mm -hmm. women and girls and making sure that we have our voices. I also started an organization called Women in Action where it's for the everyday women to achieve their life goals. Awesome. Brendan, <laughs> any follow-up questions? So a politician who hates politics, how does that, what does that look so like? So I'm not a politician, so the thing <laughs> no, about if you are, if you become a politician, and so No, a, that cannot happen. Oh my God, no. your name my children little, would come after me if I did. A placard in front of you, and it's official? How does that look like? I think it would be really cute to see my name in a placard. <laughs> um, but no, I am a mother first, and I want my children to not go through the things that I went through going mm. through school, and I don't want other people's children to go through that as mm -hmm. well. So I'm coming in as a mom first, everything else is secondary. Mike, I forgot the, what our yeah. questions are, but it, um, so cut me off if I'm You can ask whatever you like. No, but what, what, so what was it about the sex ed conversation that set you off? Because I also thought, as a parent, thought that was just weird. It was a weird it, it was, wasn't it? Being, be having this so conversation. But. It was like... I found out about the WISH Task Force presenting, mm -hmm. wanted to present their sex ed curriculum that they found, Making Proud Choices. And then all of a sudden there was this news release of all of this bad stuff that was, and I was like, but nobody has seen the actual curriculum, so what were you talking about? So then when you ask the question and they're looking at you like you have 10 heads, because mm -hmm. why do you even know that this happened? Right. And then you're gonna make a vote for parents and students, but you haven't actually seen anything and you haven't done anything. You didn't do your due diligence mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And not involving parents in something that sophisticated, because a lot of parents need the same thing. Yeah. So I feel like it was time to do something else. If you had, if, if you were a part of the board at that time, what would that conversation have looked like? I think you just said it with more. We would have had a forum where yeah. parents could see both versions that were being offered. Let us make our own decisions. Yeah. Don't make them for us. Inform us. Don't influence us mm -hmm. on what we're supposed to do. Give us the opportunity to make our own decision. Because you might have gotten people that wanted the Michigan model, but you didn't give them that option. Right. So. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> So, Worcester is owed, theoretically, in excess of $100 million because the state has been underfunding us. Um, what would you like to see the city of Worcester do about that? Definitely um, fight for our funding. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's more important to get the city legislation on board as well. Make them hold the state accountable and actually go after them. Involve the parents that and the students here to start calling and making that those decisions as well. Like, call in and make that complaint. Let them know that we need our funding back. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and so, and so this, the, the current plan, which seems to be involved suing the state somehow, mm -hmm. you think this is on the right track? I want to know why we're not joining forces with the other cities that are still in the state. Why are we doing our own? Mm -hmm. I would much rather us be a collaborative because we're better in numbers than we are being solo. And if they're fighting for the same things and they're suing for the same things, why aren't we joining those forces? I'm also, a, here's a free idea for you if you'd like. I'm also a big fan of recognizing that uh, all of Boston's water 
comes from the Quabbin Reservoir, which means it has to pass through Worcester County. Mm. And I think it's time we go to resource wars, right? Like mm. every time Boston said, well, we don't have this $100 million for it, okay, then we don't have any water for you anymore. And <laughs> that's when a couple of our state reps showed up the Wachusett Dam with a hand grenade, and we're like, hey, this is it. We can, we can shut it off <laughs> I don't now. How about the hand grenade? But <laughs> oh, yeah, no hand grenade. But I, you know, it's, uh, the, we've, been, we've talked in the past that, you know, the, the likelihood of getting back $100 million, like that's a, that's a huge sum of money to mm. claw back. Uh, at a time where the budget uh, on the state level is almost, you know, it's getting smaller, not bigger, it seems. I don't know why, but it seems to be. It's a man, you know, we've got so much potential, uh, mm-hmm. like literal force that we can mm-hmm. use over the resources. To where it's at. And then also having the... Don't actually use that idea. It's a terrible <laughs> I'm not doing any hand grenades, people, I promise. Yeah, yeah, okay. But also looking at the, the city as to why they take 3% out of all of the grants that come into the school system. Mm -hmm. Why can't they let that money stay with the schools? That it comes over onto the so-called city side of Mm -hmm. the budget rather Mm -hmm. than the And it needs to stay with the the schools. At the end of the day, our schools and our children are gonna be our future. We have to make sure that that's in place and accurate where we're actually teaching our kids Mm -hmm. how to run this world once they get out. Yep, fair enough, fair enough. so what's important for people to know about academic out- the academic outcomes of our different schools or our school system in general? I think they're doing a good job at training our kids to go into a trade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because like our kids don't really have the knowledge in order to move forward. Like when I was growing up, we had home ec. Mm-hmm. We had financial literacy classes. Mm-hmm. I knew how to write write a signature. Yeah. Our kids don't have any idea. They can't sign anything and they can't manage money. They don't know how to cook and all of these things that came with school. Mm-hmm. Because what we're supposed to be doing in the school system is teaching them how to live in the real world. Right. And we're supposed to make sure that they are able to have the fundamentals to get into a college. Mm -hmm. A lot of our kids are going to college having to start at the remedial part because they don't have the the knowledge and the skills to actually go just into classes. Mm -hmm. And what what do we do to change that? We need to diversify the population. We need to change the curriculum. We need to stand on our own two feet and say that we can, we need to do some things that are different. Incorporate civics, incorporate home ec and things like that in order to give our kids the education from the past in order to move forward. You didn't. You didn't go to Worcester Public Schools, right? No, I did not. Me neither. <laughs> what, what, what was the school system like where you were? So I was in Lemister High. I was at Crocker and Fitchburg. Um, Crocker was something different, but they're the ones who taught me how to do financial literacy mm-hmm. in third grade. Um, when I went to Lemister High, that's where I learned the home ec and all of that stuff and Johnny Appleseed. So I was sure, a Lemister sure. Fitchburg kid. Um, <laughs> um, but I learned how to survive once I got out of high school because mm-hmm. college was not my first route. My daughter yells at me now about that, but it wasn't my first thing to do. I wanted to explore because my parents had me hostage for a little while in the house. I wanted to explore. And then once I started having children, that's when I went back to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? So I guess it's more philosophical and and not necessarily something that a school committee member even actually has a lot of pullover, Mm -hmm. but so much of our school day is now defined, or curriculum is defined by standards. Mm, The MCAS. Everything that you just stated, I had the same experience, right? And those are all things that are providing immense value, uh, Mm -hmm. especially if we assume that not everybody picks up all those skill sets at Mm -hmm. home. Uh, How do we find the time within the constraints of our existing curriculums that are kind of handed to us or, you know, that we don't have, there doesn't seem to be a lot of wiggle room for the average Mm -hmm. educator, it seems, in the classroom. I think that could come down to different organizations throughout the the city that we could actually utilize Mm -hmm. and resource. We could have them come in to do an after-school program Mm -hmm. just for those items. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If we can get the funding in order to do that, and some of these organizations will do it for free because they see the benefit of our kids having these skills at the end of the day. I just feel like we need to collaborate a little bit more Mm -hmm. in the school system here in Los there. All right. What's important for people to know about discipline in our schools? Mm, that it sucks. What do you want to be, see, be, be seen done differently? I oh. want it to be equal across the board. I don't okay. want the 
Well, I mean, everybody wants that, right? Yeah, but the issue is that nobody wants to hold people accountable for when they don't do it. Sure. So you have the principals that are afraid of their teachers, or you have teachers that are afraid of the principal because she has too much pull and you don't want to go against that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the only people that are hurting are our students, mm -hmm. especially the black and, black and brown kids are seriously hurting with the discipline that's happening. I know of a fifth grader who got expelled for a fight that didn't even happen on school property. Hmm. The person came back to the school and lied on the child. They didn't do any due diligence and actually to prove anything. They just expelled the child from the school. Who does that? That doesn't, that's not even the regular world. You need to do some digging into situations and stop accusing those that, are, that don't look like you. This is not, a, I guess, a, a question so much related to your race, but just a mm -hmm. personal. Do you feel as though adults are more afraid of kids than they were? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, that's, I agree. Oh, yeah. But I, just, <laughs> I feel like kids, have, and in some capacity, have never been softer, yet adults seem to be more afraid yes. of them than they ever have been. And I don't, the language that you hear adults use to describe mm -hmm. children who are small and <laughs> they're not very threatening in most cases. Um, I agree. Yeah, okay. That's, you know, I have two, I feel like I have, I have, two, I have two different tangents that well, I'm not going to take us down 100% down those okay. side paths, but I just want to touch on them in case maybe mm -hmm. in like three minutes we can get some more constructive on okay. these. One of these is that I have literally, so I hate public school policy. I try not to talk about it. I try not to pay attention to it. But I do occasionally. Except for the entire year I am, there's an election. I am occasionally <laughs> forced to, to talk, talk to people about it. And I, so I've talked to many people down through the years. I have never heard a single person ever, ever, ever say to me, oh yeah, the MCAS, good idea. Good setup. Right. Every single person is just like the MCAS worse than Hitler. That's mm -hmm. basically the baseline, or or way worse than Hitler. Some people say. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. what? Who is the constituency for this, and why do we? Do, why is this being done? Are you serious? Yeah. Well, it's a lobbying effort. I mean, right. you had folks going back in the 90s when, when Mass so Massachusetts got decided to get ahead of the curve of No Child Left Behind. So No Child Left Behind was a Bush era federal policy mm -hmm. um, of doing standardized testing of uh, standardized curriculums, but involving testing. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of like an unfunded mandate, right? And that's always the fear of education because money is always a concern no matter mm -hmm. where you are, right. that like the federal government hands down a mandate, now you're gonna put together the resources to make that happen. Yeah. Massachusetts decided to get ahead of the curve and we took ticked off that box back in the 90s, um, well before the Bush era. They just knew that's where things were going. Um, but you look at the folks who were involved, it was all of the, the curriculums and all of the, the conversations were, were basically um, shuttled through through by the publishing companies. Uh, so, you know, when, when we think of like the MCAS, we don't really think of what goes on. We think of the tests that our kids get all stressed mm -hmm. out by and take. We don't really think of all the things that take place behind it, like the preparatory work, which is books, uh, all of the actual- That they don't have. We'll put all the papers that are involved mm -hmm. and there's only one group that stands to really benefit from that and those are the large publishers I mean Pearson is probably the best example of a publishing company that makes a fortune off of and has a, a, a near uh, a near monopoly in, in the education market because it simplifies and standardizes the industry to just say everybody in Massachusetts needs to buy the same books we or in this case, the book. same testing materials and sure. the same correcting materials and sure. the technology to, to, to back that up. And it was, yeah. you know, there really, there was a lot of benefit to be had from the uh, the private side of things for the industry that was, um, that has long time been involved in, uh, in, in producing curriculums, producing yeah. test, testing materials and yeah. Could we get rid of the MCAS or the feds are already dictating we do something like this? So Well, I mean, I just point. suggested that we start threatening Boston's water supply. <laughs> I mean, you're asking you're not, the wrong yeah, person not, I mean, in terms I, of what we can I, well, this is why I am asking you. I mean, is it is it is it? I mean, do, would it require some sort of terrorist style thing in order? Like you're. Suggesting? I'm not associated with any of the terrorists. No, though, no, just no, so y'all know. No, no. Me neither. I'm a hundred percent. Because y'all the question. I'm a nice lady who just wants to run for school committee. For many this years, is, I've gone on record as being as all Brendan's ideas. I, guess. I don't even feel like I need no. to associate myself from. But the answer to your question, I think, is yes. Like it's nothing more. Like it's a, it's a local version of what we just did with uh, marijuana in Massachusetts, right? Federally, it's completely illegal, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts says, yeah, we don't care. We're just doing this. We're going to make some money off of it. We think it's better for our population. The general public, to your point, mm -hmm. you've never met somebody who's pro-MGAS. Uh, so 
Yeah, it, there's no reason in my mind why the city of Worcester couldn't turn around and say, okay, this is all well and good. Mm -hmm. Starting 2021, we're not doing testing anymore. If somebody mm -hmm. wants to hold it against us, so uh, be yeah, it. I mean, aren't the feds going to say then we're not going to give you any money? Like, well, the feds they, don't give us money, really. It's that's the state. The, oh, the state. It's the state. And they don't give this. And I have a feeling that if the second largest city in New England turned around, similar to your point, mm -hmm. like the power in numbers when it comes to mm -hmm. lawsuits, second largest city in New England says, yeah, we're not playing ball anymore. Yes. That's enough revenue uh, that would be lost for the publishing companies that then you'd have other cities in town saying, no, if we do this the right way, maybe we can all just walk away from this. So all right, the so relationship with the, the, the Federal Department of Education is an interesting one. Going back to the Kennedy era, yes. uh, they can hand down mandates uh, so that and I think it's, it's well intended, at least on paper, right? You're, you're pushing a philosophy across all the states to build some degree of equity, uh, where, again, going back to the Kennedy era, there was not a lot of equity from state to state in terms of the delivery of, of public education, but they don't have money attached to it. And that's where the whole idea of, of local control comes from. Yeah. It's why, you know, I mean, arguably, our, our local school board committee races are the most important because it's the one mm -hmm. aspect of politics or government that is all about local control. The fund models are local uh, and the, the, the curriculum as long as it fits within a broader set of guidelines that the federal government hands out are all local as well. Chantel do you want to do you want to <laughs> say or that or we can just keep going? I think we can keep going but I do agree with you yeah. that well, I keep it local. Minus the terrorism. Uh, minus the terrorism clear, for real right? and the hand grenades and yes. all of that stuff. We're not blowing, we're not blowing a single, single thing up. Um, What's your experience with education policy and what in your life has helped you understand how your decisions would affect our 25,000 students? That would be my babies. Um, mm -hmm. So I was never really an activist the way that I am now until I had children. Once my daughter, my oldest, went to school, I got involved in everything because one, I'm nosy. Um, and two, I needed to know what was happening around mm -hmm. her and who was going to be in the rooms when teaching her and what were their backgrounds and all of that stuff. So I feel me coming in with the education policies and things like that, I'm going to have that lens mm -hmm. to make sure that all students are taken care of. Like I'm the mama bear, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And are, that's what I do. Are your kids in the Worcester Valley schools? They are. Right? I have three at Claremont. My daughter just graduated, so now two. And then my son's at Chandler Elementary. How, how's it going for him? He did so good. He's so upset that he's <laughs> leaving his kindergarten teacher. Uh, but I think overall we're doing good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, well, and that's, I mean, that's kind of the education policy chunk of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take one pre-programmed diversion and go to commodities news. Brent crude oil is $66 a barrel, up 5% on the week and down 15% on the year. Bitcoin is $13,000, up 36% on the week and up 103% on the year. A crazy week for Bitcoin, Mike. I mean, anybody who watches anybody who watches this show actually would have no idea what to do because all we ever do is mention the price and say, why? No explanation. <laughs> no idea. It's important to somebody, I'm sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to know. It's very surprising to me to look at it. I never know whether it's going to be like, yeah, $2 or a billion dollars. It's always one or the other. I never know why. <laughs> uh, Chantal, how much can you bench? 200. 200. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you can just say that. With <laughs> too many people, too many people run for public office and then they come on here and they're like, I don't know how much I can bench. How no. would I ever know that? And it's like, come on. You have to be strong. So once you have children, you have to be stronger than your kids because they're going to get bigger than you. And all my children are taller than me, right? So um, my husband <laughs> told me, he said, you have to be able to bench your own weight. So you, if you have ever in a situation with somebody who's bigger than you, you need to be able to get them off. And that's what I do. I like your husband. <laughs> this, is a good, this is a good philosophy. This is a good philosophy. And uh, who's your favorite character on The Wire? So we had this conversation. Um, I was going to say Bunny, the uh -huh. chief from um, The Wire, because he saw a problem. And he filled the need, even though the city didn't like it, the politicians didn't like what he did by putting all of the people that were using and addicts in one space to get them away from the kids in the schools and the community. They didn't like it, but at the end of the day, he was able to get the community better and the kids didn't have to see these people yeah. dying and things like that and using. But he paid, he paid the price career-wise. Oh, yes, he did. interesting arc. Yeah, but if you are willing to fight for something, you're willing to sacrifice anything mm -hmm. for it. So I would much rather sacrifice that than the significance of what I was trying to impact. Mm -hmm. So. And was, 
because he sacrificed his security and mm-hmm. job. But the significance is much better. Were they like a foster family to somebody? Hmm? Were they like a foster family to somebody? Honey's family? Honey, am I confusing him with somebody yeah, else? I don't think so. Yeah, no. He didn't, have any, he didn't, he didn't adopt any <coughs> of those kids. That's all right. Um, no. Uh, you know, you. I mean, you were you were <laughs> you were asking before, you were asking Brendan about before the show why we asked people about the wire, and Brendan did not remember <laughs> did not remember the reason. So I'll just mention that, which is that um, long time ago, like ten years ago, maybe the guy who was elected the I think mayor of Reykjavik, yeah. Iceland, well, he was coming from sort of a um, performing arts background and kind of a prankster party thing, but they ended up winning the election, okay. and one of the uh, tenets of their party was they said. You know, like we have our politics, but we are interested to work and collaborate with any politician mm-hmm. who has seen all five seasons of The Wire. Any best, and this seems like, and a I've seen all five. Yeah. <laughs> nice work, nice work. Uh, do we want to move on to non-school? Yeah, you know, I would love to. If there's a, a, a couple other a questions, so as a parent, um, my son just finished up Forest Grove. Uh, and we're starting to make some different decisions for high school and whatnot. Mm-hmm. How are your feelings overall with the, the public schools? You've been happy with the, the setup? Is it? Mm, they're not as welcoming as I thought they were supposed to be. Mm-hmm. When I moved to Worcester 11 years ago, I was told that the schools are so welcoming. They want parent involvement and they want you to talk. And, no, not really. Yeah. They don't want you to talk if your opinion is not the same as theirs, mm-hmm. which I don't like. And my opinion is never like anyone else's. And I don't feel like we should all think the same things because then we're just robots. But um, Claremont has been the best school out of all of them. Mm-hmm. So we started at Elm Park. We went to Thorndike. We went to, because I moved three times in the 11 years I've been here. Um, Thorndike. Channel Elementary, the first time around, I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the teachers. I didn't like the fact that they couldn't tell me what they were teaching my son. I'm like, I brought him in. He knew this part. What did you enhance him on? And they said, I'm not sure he came in and he was just this. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I didn't like that. So I didn't go back to Chandler for a very long time. Um, Woodland, we went to and I did not care for their strategic plan Mm -hmm. as to the principal made all of the decisions because if you're biased Mm -hmm. and you don't want a certain person in your school that principal can just say no and I don't like that right so but outside of that it's been good yeah it's It's all I got yeah how's the election going so far the election's going good Um, we have our plan we have that voter builder Mm -hmm. um, so that we can Wait, you know, what's, what you have what? The vote builder. Okay. So it has all of the people that have yeah. voted in all of the state and local oh, okay. uh, politics thing. Um, so we're doing that. We have our literature, lawn signs finally. Oh, um, nice. So it's interesting to say the least mm-hmm. for somebody who never wanted to run. <laughs> Just a heads up, Mike spends a very significant amount of time, uh, usually t- as we get past the primary, critiquing everybody's lawn signs uh, for. Well, mine are pretty. Uh, I mean, I, let me say first of all, I'm glad you. I'm glad you think so. And second of all, that remains to be seen. I will show you. <laughs> we'll I'll send you out. the template right now. I mean, this year, <laughs> uh, the the one new technology I have this year is I have a scanning app for my phone, mm-hmm. which sort of like if you have a, you know, if you have like a, you know, you take a photo of a piece of paper, and you know, it's always going to be like at a weird angle or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the app will, you know, figure out like this is the piece of paper, and it takes a picture of it, and then it figures out like, and this is what it looks like if I straighten it. So I'll straighten it out, and then I'll do optical character recognition on it too, because, and then I'll save it as a PDF. So this is cool. But the cool thing about this is normally my photos of the lawn signs, you know, there is always at a weird angle. (laughs) You know, it's like it's like behind somebody's wall or underneath (laughs) a parked car or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the photos are not always great. But this year. This app is going to make every lawn site at least look like a rectangle. Okay. Which is <laughs> is going to be very exciting. Yeah, that's never been a strong suit for Worcester. And it's, it's a, I feel like it's kind of been a, a thorn in both of our sides. That it's like like Connie Luke's. Her sign is probably always the most legible of all signs, and it just hits the point. To, like this is the name. I, remember, I think it was Cola when Cola was running. Cola mm-hmm. and He did the. It was like this Coca Cola stylized yep. label, which was genius. But at the same time, without the name recognition, it's like I, I feel like a lot of people are just driving around saying, "Why is this whole neighborhood such a big fan of <laughs> yeah. Coke products?" Well, this was, is, <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's a challenge about doing creative political advertising, which is that like if your thing doesn't look like a political sign. 
and you see it in somebody's yard, you're like, I don't know, that could be an ad for Coke. It could be some real estate deal. It could Another be festival coming anything. up. Anything. Yeah. It could be anything. It, if it doesn't look sort of boring and crappy, right. how is anybody going to think it's a yard sign? <laughs> <I know. laughs> that's terrible. I mean, that's the reality. <laughs> that's terrible. Like, that's where we're like, at. Connie yeah, signs are Connie signs are very good and very just readable. Yeah. Um, now, what do you do for the ones that don't have any signs, like Brian O'Connell? That's. I mean, Not well, a first sign. of all, oh, <laughs> Not oh, a sign. oh, there is a Brian O'Connell sign. <laughs> Out Where there. I've this never is, seen one. <laughs> the year, the years that I do a good job on this are the years that I find like the one sign okay. that's probably Brian doesn't have, but like his nephew or somebody has from forty years ago, and he pulls it out every year, and I like find that yard and I take that photo of that <laughs> sign. I mean, I think I have old Brian O'Connell signs, but it's true. Like a lot of the, especially a lot of the older politicians have essentially no signs yeah. or very few signs. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I, you know, again, I always, in, in part, I admire that too, just that, like, that sense of, like, yeah, just kind of feeling like I know how I get elected, mm -hmm. and how I get elected is not by, um, it's reminding people I'm still alive. But yeah, it's, it's not by winning, it's, it's, it's not by winning literally any popularity contest except for the popularity contest, which is that particular vote on that particular yeah. morning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Yard signs, not part of the look strategy. Mm -hmm. No. So there's some of that are around. Keep using them. Mm -hmm. Keep them clean. You can keep using them for 30 years. But in that, right, what you just said, that's the important part with Connie signs in particular, right? Is she actually managed to catch fluorescent colors in their first wave in the late 80s and see them right through to the aughts when they came back through with contemporary pop culture. It I mean, was like, you yeah. know, Connie actually sat out 30 years of waiting for fluorescent colors to make a comeback. I'm not going to say anything more about this. I mean, they peaked twice in her political career. Otherwise, I could talk about Connie Science for an hour. Okay, okay. okay. let's not do that. that. So let's not do that. Let's not do that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you know, it is interesting to me, like, what does it look like to campaign in uh, these days? Because it felt like there was a couple of years there, maybe a decade there, where it was kind of back and forth between, like, are we using social media effectively? Mm -hmm. Are we not using mm -hmm. social media effectively? Is it even relevant in this campaign? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, are we using the latest database, whatever, tracking and analysis stuff? Uh, and now it feels like we're at a point where, like, at least whenever I read people's secondhand accounts of campaigns, that people are pretty... Pretty much, it's pretty much just like a plug and play deal now, mm -hmm. more than like, can we figure out how to use it well? Let's talk about body cameras. So like, uh, people are always talking about like, we should have body cameras and like, it'll solve some problems out there. And the city of Worcester has had a pilot program going since of some time of police body cameras. Brendan Malkin, do you want to say something about body cameras? So I, look for this piece of paper. <laughs> I think I mentioned this last time we brought it, brought it up. The one thing that I was really interested in with um, the technology itself is that for years I assumed that when we were talking body cameras it was going to be this like super hard, high end, hard to get like video system sort of thing. I'm pretty sure the cameras that Worcester is using, they're actually the same cameras that you can buy on like Amazon or Woot or whatever, and they're actually like not very expensive. They're, they, they work really well, but I, I think they charge them a lot. I mean, they charge the police a lot for them. Well, I'm sure right. it's under contract, and there's probably uh, you know maintenance programs, and somebody has to hold the video footage and whatnot. Right. That's, right. I mean, we are in a city where you know it was only about 15 years ago the city hall claimed that it didn't have enough storage space for emails. I know. So it was well, I think to print uh, them out and file. Them. Right. <laughs> Miraculously, that problem got solved. <laughs> so the the so-called this is a report from June the fourth, the so-called body worn cameras pilot program. Uh, and body cameras was began too much. May the it really was. <laughs> it began May the first, and twenty officers volunteered to participate in the program. Um, and so for now, two months I guess that they've been doing this. Sixteen from operations, two from traffic, two from neighborhood response. Um, I guess it's probably a neighborhood response guy whose camera I'm the most familiar with. Um, and they have a whole policy here that they're doing for this during this pilot about when are you allowed to turn it off? When do you have to turn it off? Um, basically, like, it's worth checking out because the, um, you know, I do a lot of soup kitchen volunteering and so I end up talking to a lot of detail cops. Mm -hmm. And so this is the only reason that I've like seen them and been able to discuss them. And, um, you know, it's like a square deal that's in the middle 
kind mm-hmm. of Iron Man style, but less cool in the middle of the officer's chest. I mean, actually, the other day, it was an officer who was not, maybe not in plain clothes, but just wearing like a t-shirt and somehow had a deal mm-hmm. so that his Iron Man thing was like strapped onto this shirt. I don't know if it has like a little push pin in it or what it has. Um, mm-hmm. But like, if you can see the little red, little red spot there, that means that the switch has been flipped to the on position. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it was funny because like, I was aware that these existed and like, I don't know, there was some kind of conversation that was going on and some, I think somebody admitted it as, you know, to some random thing and the police were like, you know, this is being recorded and we were just both like, whoa, like, okay, mm-hmm. like that makes sense. But also it sort of makes you feel like, um, entrapment a little bit, not mm-hmm. like entrapment. No, it makes me feel <laughs> like, like, me. like, I think, I mean, I think, you know, like, so let's say, for example, you want to just have a conversation of like, oh, well, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice hypothetical of the, pol- the police showing up. You know, you call the police showing up because, you know, your your uncle was over there and he was getting drunk and throwing stuff. And then, you know, whatever, maybe he left and the police came anyway. And now you need to have some conversation with the police about the deal with your uncle. Mm-hmm. And like so that even if you feel comfortable with that officer talking frankly about your uncle and mm-hmm. what's the deal with his violence and drinking and whatever, mm-hmm. you might not feel comfortable that this is being recorded. Mm-hmm. And the officers, again, have some discretion to turn it off, but um, in that kind of situation especially, they might, I don't think that they would want to or maybe should turn it off if they're responding to a, pos- responding to a potential violent situation. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's exactly when you want to have that camera going so that if your uncle then looms around the corner and gets shot, you have a record of at least what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was interesting. I don't know. I think it's interesting to say that the police office can turn it off whenever they want. They like can, that kind so of they throws off they the point turn. of mm-hmm. holding them accountable to uh, what they're doing. I, gotta, I mean, out just there. just to correct, there's a whole. I mean, there's a whole deal about when they about when they can turn it off. Um, Hopefully, uh, while using like the restroom. Yeah, because nobody wants to see that. Yeah. So, for example... But I think that should be like a <laughs> thing that they're not controlling. Because if you have cops that are terrible, which some are, some aren't... Then they'll use that. You know what well, I mean? Like, so you can turn I, it off so, whenever you want. So, I, so, I give, so uh, I'll give you this. Before entering a private residence without exigent circumstances, the officer shall seek the occupant's consent to continue recording inside the residence. If the civilian declines to give consent... And in the absence of exigent circumstances, the officer shall turn off the camera while in the residence. Huh. Okay. So in this theoretical thing, maybe if you're like, well, the uncle has definitely left and the officer is like, the uncle's gone. Can I come in and we can sit down and figure out what's going on? And you're like, mm-hmm. yes, we can. And he's like, can I leave the camera on? And you're like, no, we can't. Then the officer could be like, OK, I will go in, ma'am, and we will talk about it and I will have the camera off. In Massachusetts, to be clear, Massachusetts has some interesting uh, consent laws when it comes to recording. That's where that comes from. So okay. we have we have first person consent laws in Massachusetts. If you go back long enough, that's actually where Massachusetts is the state where things got weird initially for recording police officers uh, in while in the the scope of their their job. There was a, a case with the state police where someone was recording secretly in their house. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't ask the the state police officers who were, and it was like a raid of a house or something like that. And the state police tried to file uh, criminal charges against this couple or whoever for recording them without their permission. The courts, I, I believe correctly, decided that well, that was in their house. Like you came into their mm-hmm. house so they can record whatever they want to there. Um, but it's like like our wiretapping laws where this all originates from. Uh, you need to have, if you're recording somebody, that party's consent or a warrant to be able to mm-hmm. do so. So like if you're walking into somebody's house or property that isn't uh, within the public view, uh, that person would then have the expectation of privacy in that area versus right. like uh, in a public space where there would be no expectation of privacy. And there's a second, there's a separate one which is... Uh, <clears throat> also in, would include residences, locker rooms, places of worship, religious ceremonies, mm. certain parts of hospitals and clinics, law offices, daycare facilities. Um, yeah, like, you know, so it'll be interesting to see. I guess it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like this is I feel like this is the kind of stuff. Yeah. Where it feels like as a society overall, something like warrants. Mm-hmm. People watch Law and Order. They know how search warrants work. <laughs> they know that when the cops come mm-hmm. up, you're, you're supposed to be like, 
come back with a warrant copper. You know, <laughs> you know that doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> but I understand what you're. I see I mean, where you're going, but it doesn't work for everybody at like least that. It's a, it's a, at least it's a thing. At least it's a thing that could be said. That it could be said. Yes, <laughs> yes. Implemented all the time is not. Whereas, I mean, like I said, like I, I like the body camera just thing kind of threw me like oh i didn't even even though i read this report <laughs> i didn't even real and i watched plenty of tv stuff i didn't even i didn't realize like oh like this is weird like i need to see this more in some episodes of cop mm. shows where they show how this goes wrong so i can get a real sense of what's my comfort level because mm. until i watch enough about cop, how am i really going to know how it's going to play out in reality until i see it play it on shows well i mean you've seen it play out in reality though like you've seen these cops that have killed people on their cameras and they're still found innocent mm -hmm. so you've seen it yes. you can see how it can be played out at the end oh, of the day i mean that part of it i really so that, that part is not it, like mm -hmm. it really helps yeah that part everyone. of it that part of it i've seen i guess i guess what i mean is like the part of it where it's like uh the part of it where it's a situation where you where you feel like this is a low-key situation mm -hmm. and like Nobody's getting <coughs> shot and nobody's getting punched in this situation. Mm -hmm. I've been in this situation a hundred times mm -hmm. and no, it never turned into anything. I have no expectation it's going to turn into anything today. But there's also this recording, official government recording yeah. device of law enforcement. Well, I mean, three we go feet through this me. all the time with the show. I mean, it, you would be shocked at the number of times people come on our program and openly <laughs> admit to crimes. <laughs> to, to felonies. <laughs> to felonies. Oh, right? wow. like, and it's like, we'll have to jump in like, okay, you don't really need to talk about that right now. That's where I think it, it does. I agree with your point 100%. There's this other side. I think it's what Mike's getting at too, where it's like there there is something about the you know the ability to have a candid relationship with uh, any government official, mm -hmm. right? That you would hope isn't part of the official record or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, like you saying the other day, you're actually witnessing somebody admitting to a crime because they haven't yet adjusted their mindset. Oh, this person is now not just a human being; they're actually a recording device. Well, I, right, and, and, and right, I think someone stops being a human being in in some capacity. Mm -hmm. when they are in fact like a, a recording device. I think we all should know at this point in time if you're talking to law enforcement, whether you're friends or not, that's being filed away somewhere. Mm -hmm. hey, but this right. is a and permanent that, record yeah. sort of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. that yeah. is, and the, the candid nature of that relationship with the public. In, a, in an ideal world, I think, uh, which we obviously haven't achieved, but in an ideal world, I think we would all hope that there, there would be room for that sort of candid relationship mm -hmm. that you can have an actual conversation with somebody that represents uh, the law enforcement side of the universe in a and not be part of a public record. I mean, it's, it's I don't know, it's a weird kind of, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I, you know. It's a RoboCop sort of thing yeah. in a way, right? I guess it, in a weird, yeah. unintended way, it ends up stripping some, even more of the humanity from law enforcement. Which, you know, and again, like, there's many people for whom, like, again, like, the candidate relationship involves, like, police brutality or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they're like, that's not what the candidate right. relationship I want. And so that's why yes. you have the cameras. Um, yeah, like I said, it just sort of, uh, yeah. It took me unawares. It yeah. took me unawares. And I, I wonder if, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wonder if members of the general public are going to feel that happening more often. The like, oh, crap, there's a camera here. Didn't think about that more often. Or if they're going to feel the like, well, there's a camera here. So maybe like my, my you know, my worst fears are somewhat mm -hmm. less likely to happen because there's a camera here. Or which one they're going to be feeling more mm -hmm. often. It'll definitely be... Um 50-50, I think, if not 75. 75. It depends mm -hmm. on who. It depends on who, on you who you you're want. talking to. You know, yes, like again, does. like as a clean-cut middle-class white guy, you're like, okay. <laughs> don't I, you know, look at me or a black man. I don't, <laughs> Listen, yeah. it's not the same thing. <laughs> I, you know, I hear you 100. percent I hear you 100. percent um, Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's my comment. <laughs> now I don't want you recording me anymore. Like your, your position on this whole thing. <sighs> I mean, we all may, you know, whatever. 20 years from now we all may regret ever doing any of these kinds yes. of candid things because all somehow you know the old like give me six lines from any man and I will yeah, you yeah. know turn him into a criminal whatever the heck Cardinal Richelieu has said like mm -hmm. or you can do that with this podcast mm -hmm. just as easily as anything else so I, I think it happens pretty frequently yeah mm -hmm. Chantal thanks for being on this show and Thank talking about me. talking about you know justice and equity and mm -hmm. kids going to school and the whole nine mm -hmm. before we wrap up anything you want to say to uh potential voters out there? I would say I am not as experienced as some of the people that are running or those that have run, but I am a passionate mother bear where I fight for my children and I will fight for yours as well. 
Awesome. Thank you for being on. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you for being on. Everybody, we'll Thank see you, you. Uh, next week on 508.